Hi, I'm Allie Hamilton, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the Come As You Are podcast. Every week, we'll be talking about some aspect of healing, usually around childhood wounds and complicated familial relationships. The topics will always coincide with my personal essay of the week, and this will be a place where we can take a deep dive together. I'm so thrilled you've joined me and delighted for you to always come as you are. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome to our talk today. The topic is the goodbye girl, how to handle a live wire. And it's all about um, those events that can happen in childhood usually that create a what I was calling a live wire, you know, this this wound or this scar that is so deep, it really has serious repercussions um, moving forward. And that certainly happened for me in my life. And I'm sure, you know, there are things that you can remember from your own childhood that you can look back on as an adult and realize like, oh yeah, <laughs> that created a tendency in me or a fear in me that I had, you know, I played out for quite a long time as I grew. And in my life and in my experience, one of the most sort of formative things that occurred happened right before, the week before my fourth birthday, which I know is so young and some of it is just so clear to me Um, my grandmother died and she was my mother's mother and she really in ways that I of course could not have understood she was really holding my entire life in her hands you know she really was the glue that was keeping everything together and she was my mother's best friend she was with us every day my entire childhood until she got very ill she she had a cold one fall and she couldn't shake it the fall before she died and eventually they realized it was actually breast cancer and it spread to her lungs and it killed her so um but my mother and my father were having serious struggles in their marriage And my mother did not want her mother to be worried about her or me on top of, you know, being that gravely ill. And so my mom and dad were sort of keeping up appearances so that she wouldn't be concerned. And then, you know, the idea, I think, was as soon as my grandmother passed, my parents were going to split. But, of course, I didn't know that. So... That is what occurred, Um, and I was writing about, you know, things that I, of course, can look back on as an adult and kind of string the pieces together, and there were some conversations I was able to have with both parents along the way. My mother was very, she was not the kind of person who wanted to have those deep conversations about things that had transpired. She didn't like to... Um, talk about anything in the past or anything current that was uncomfortable or unpleasant but she did drink um, and that's kind of how she coped with her pain she wouldn't talk about it but she would drink about it and unfortunately that you know that created a lot of um, those that had its own repercussions that had a huge impact on my life but everyone's life around her um you know she's an alcoholic and she wouldn't face that or deal with it and so when my grandmother died it set off a chain of events that changed everything and so she died and the following week my dad left and I don't know why he left without saying goodbye to me I you know that's a conversation that I never did have with him um but that's what happened so I woke up one morning you know a few days after my grandmother had died at which I I understood I had been there the the day that it happened um we were all at the hospital I wasn't allowed in the room with her because I was too little 
And so I couldn't actually say goodbye. And I didn't really know what dying meant or what it meant that she was in heaven, you know, but I had been there and I understood I wasn't going to be able to see her anymore. And then a few days later, I woke up and my mom was just sitting at the dining room table by herself. And she let me know that my dad wasn't going to be living with us anymore. And then later that day, she said we were going to go to this farm to visit a friend of hers. And there were pigs and horses and chickens, and it was going to be fun. Um, When we got there, it became clear to me that she was going to leave. And I was staying at this farm with her friend who I'd never met before. And that woman had a daughter who was just a little bit older than I was. So, uh, and that's what happened. And so I was writing about, and that I do recall, you know, very vividly um, some of the events over that week are just you know kind of seared into my memory my parents had a fight the week before my grandmother died my grandmother died my dad left I go to this farm and basically watch my mother drive away and I have no idea kind of like where I am who these people are what this farm is when my mother's coming back where my dad is where heaven is like you know my aunt my uncle I knew that they were in New Jersey with my cousins, but I didn't know where I was and I didn't know their phone number. I certainly wouldn't have been able, been able to figure out how to reach them or get to them. So it was just very kind of like everyone that I knew and loved disappeared. And it had a, a huge, huge impact on me as it would. And I was never able to ask my mom why she left me with this friend of hers at this farm instead of taking me to my aunt and uncle's house where I would have been extremely comfortable. But I know I know my mother and she was not one to ask for help ever. She was not one to air her dirty laundry. I don't know if she had even told her brother and his wife, my aunt and uncle, that they were that my you know she and my dad were splitting up I know she felt a lot of shame about that and a lot of rage and so I I suspect that she took me to this friend's farm instead of to a place that I knew with people I loved because she probably hadn't broken the news to them yet and maybe it was just you know too much to share at once you know, mother had just died and that was my uncle's mother as well. Maybe she just felt like it was just too much to ask them to take care of me at that moment or, you know, whatever. I don't know, but that is what happened. I don't know how long I was at this farm. I don't know if it was like, you know, several days longer. And I could never ask my mom that question. She was not one who was going to, that would, that would be the kind of question that would enrage her. You know, why are you bringing something up from so long ago? And, she would take it as a criticism or, you know, an attack or she just, this is not the kind of conversation that she would ever have. So, um, those, you know, those experiences that we have, especially the first five years of our lives, but really, I mean, beyond that and in childhood, they shape us, right? We're learning. We're like little sponges and we're learning about the world and we're learning about ourselves. And the only, the the main people that we're going to learn from are the people in our immediate family, right? The people that we, that are, that we're entrusted to that are raising us. And so I learned in that moment that like everyone can just disappear. Everyone you love can just suddenly not be there anymore. And there's nothing you can do about it. You're like powerless in the face of that. You know, there's, there's nothing. That's just it. And so as I, of course, eventually my mom came and got me and, you know, we went back to the apartment and our new lives began and our new lives were, you know, I went back and forth. My dad had an apartment 15 blocks away. He moved in with a woman who became my stepmom. Um, yeah, this was our new, this was the new rhythm uh, and the new way of things. But it, that stayed with me, that understanding that people can just, you know, suddenly disappear. And I didn't realize that that's what had happened. But as I grew, I was extremely attached to the people close to me 
my best friend at the time, um, somebody that I had gone to preschool and kindergarten, and then we ended up in um, elementary school together, and I followed her to this high school that probably was not the right high school for me, but that is how I just could not bear the idea of not being with her. And I think she was trying a few times to like create a little distance. It was probably too much. Um, but I, that it, like I couldn't, I just couldn't bear it. So part of what started to happen for me is this really intense attachment to the people close to me but at the same time, um, it took me a very long time to trust new people and to let my guard down, to really, um, you know, allow myself to be known. I was always watching for like where and when might the disaster occur that will cause this person to disappear. And so over time and as I grew and as I got older and went out into the world and started having my own relationships, that fear of being abandoned, if that's kind of what's driving you and it's the way that you're entering friendships and relationships, it's not going to go well because you're not going to be yourself. You're going to be whatever version of yourself you think you need to be to avoid being left. And what that ended up what that looked like for me is, you know, friendships that were very frequently one-sided, where I was doing a lot of giving, and, you know, it was not like a reciprocal kind of situation. And then eventually, as I got older and went out in the world and was having relationships, romantic relationships, it, I would find myself drawn toward people who had a similar dynamic to what I had known growing up, meaning sort of like unavailable people, emotionally unavailable. And then I would chase and, you know, bend over backwards and try to be perfect to both earn love, right, and to avoid being abandoned. And so, again, you're not being yourself, you're not open, you're not relaxed, you're not thinking about your own needs or what lights you up or whether you're even having a good time with this person. <laughs> you're just kind of like, in, in yoga, we call them like the samskaras, like grooves, right? So you're in this groove, it's joined action. It's something where you've learned again and again, like this cause and effect sort of relationship with things and you're repeating a pattern. And if you you know, this is not just something that they talk about in yogic philosophy, obviously, in any psychology, like if you, Freud, right, and the repetition compulsion um, and the pleasure principle, he did, he did studies, and Freud, let's just say it right up front, strange dude with some strange ideas and addicted to opium, so there's that, <laughs> but also some interesting things, you know, and one of them was um, his real surprise that his patients were more driven to heal any patterns that had not they had not been able to gain mastery over in childhood this this idea that like okay I couldn't overcome this in my childhood so I'm gonna play this out in my grown-up life and try to get that different ending that happy ending that I wasn't able to get as a kid um, and that that was stronger to his patients than the pleasure principle. He thought, you know, surely people will go in the direction of what's bringing them joy or ease or delight and not in the direction of something that's going to be, you know, that's going to bring them a lot of heartache. But that is not what he found. He found that people would repeat these patterns over and over again, trying to get a different ending. And I mean, Albert Einstein, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Um, and Jung, right? Like, I mean, when I, and I've talked about this quote before and I've written about it because it was one of those kind of light bulb, life-changing moments for me the first time I heard this quote. Um, but it, it, what, it, it goes, um, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate until you make the unconscious conscious. 
it will rule your life and you will call it fate. So until you bring these things to the surface and figure out what's driving you, right? You're just gonna, that, that stuff, that fear is gonna be driving you and you're gonna think this is just the way I'm built <laughs> or this is just the way things are, you know? Um, and so that was a huge moment for me of just realizing, okay, there's a lot of stuff swimming underneath the surface here that I really need to kind of bring into the light so I can stop repeating these patterns that lead me to heartbreak. Um, and it took years. <laughs> and so when you are thinking about kind of like, okay, I seems like I probably need to rewire some things here, you know, and looking at patterns is really helpful. If you have, if you can recognize in your life that there are things that you are repeating over and over again, like maybe you are always the giver in your relationships and other people are always the takers, right? Or um, you're always chasing after approval or rejection is a hook for you. Like if somebody is not really giving you reassurance or, or giving you what it is that you're looking for, if that sets off this feeling in you that you want to prove yourself, that you want to chase after them, you know, it's something to look at. Like there's something being hit there. And that's what I was sort of describing these wounds as almost like live wires that are just like, you know, they're just in there kind of setting off sparks. And if the wrong situation or, you know, somebody does something or says something, it's like hitting that live wire, you know, and your whole system just like um, is not, things are not easy or good for you, right? Like you can find yourself feeling really triggered or really despondent or just incredibly scared to a level that maybe doesn't fit the circumstances. And I think the term triggered gets so overused, but um, when your nervous system is overwhelmed, you know, that's a good indication that something in you, some like raw nerve, some live wire has been tripped and is just, you know, really wreaking havoc in there. And part of what in my own life and in my own sort of like healing process, what really helped me was my yoga practice. I've been practicing yoga and uh, meditating for 30 years now. And one of the main goals of those practices is just to become more responsive and less reactive. And so if you are, for example, in a situation with someone and maybe something has occurred, some altercation, but it's not, you know, maybe later you can look back on it and say, well, that was not, I responded <laughs> or I reacted uh, really like that was like a, like a 12, you know, on a scale of one to 10, but it was probably more like a three. Something happened, you know, this person probably inadvertently like stepped on your live wire. Something about the interaction or the situation has you in that like animal brain, you know, that part of the brain that thinks I'm threatened, I'm not safe. Um, or I'm being attacked, or, you know, I might die here. And that's the part of you that gets tripped, and that's where the reaction is coming from. It's coming out of your past and not out of your present. And one of the main things when you pursue a yoga practice and meditation practice is just to have a little space between the thing that has occurred and your, whatever you're going to do, whatever your response is going to be, to create a little space there for you to get grounded, to come, you know, to calm your nervous system, to slow things down. Because when you're in that like amygdala, you know, animal brain, you're not going to be able to make kind of like calm decisions, introspective, you know, you're not going to be able to reflect you're in that fight, flight, fawn, freeze, you're in that moment, you're not gonna be able to access the part of your brain that says, well, now wait a second. <laughs> is it possible that I misunderstood? You know, am I, can I give this person, is this a person who has shown me time and time again that they love me and that, you know, they want good things for me? And in that case, can I like extend the benefit of the doubt here and just 
like let the steam out of this situation and try to have a real conversation and come to some understanding together. Um, you're not going to be able to do that when your nervous system is, you know, in this heightened state. And so that is one of the goals is just being able to calm yourself and to create a little bit of space between an event and however you decide you're going to respond to it to give you the power to choose. Um, and so that, yeah, that's a big part of what happened along the way. For me, I started to understand, and this may or may not, you know, this may or may not be something we have in common, but we're going to have some aspect of this in common. Like for me, that abandonment thing was, was big. For you, it might be other things, depending on what happened in your life. Um, and so I started to understand myself. And that's a, that's a big part of healing is figuring out, okay, what is driving me? Or what does, what are those things that kind of really set me off where I'm having a very extreme reaction to a situation? Or is there a pattern that I can look at in my my personal life, my professional life. These are all ways of understanding yourself so that you can be accountable. You know, this is not about sort of like navel gazing. This is about (laughs) figuring yourself out so that you can be at peace inside and so that you can be spreading peace outside, right? It's like not just a, a gift that you're giving to yourself so that you can kind of be at ease in your own skin and so you can take care of yourself it's also a way of being accountable when you're out in the world and no understanding knowing like oh this is one of those situations where it's really hard for me um and so I learned as I was growing and practicing and studying that okay I'm getting it like I'm starting to understand some things happened in my childhood and that kid is still alive in me somewhere running through the halls you know and um and sometimes that little kid is extremely scared and I probably don't want that version of myself running the show you know it's probably not good for my four-year-old scared self to be making the decisions here it's like that kid is invited to the table but shouldn't be kind of like the CEO right that's not going to go well But for a long time in my life, that fear was driving me. And I was writing about not wanting to be held hostage by anything, you know, not by my fear of being abandoned or not by um, a substance or not by like my fear of a particular outcome, you know, not like coming to pass or coming to pass. So there is both in yoga and also in Buddhism, you'll find these teachings about attachment and how attachment leads to suffering. And the flip side of attachment is aversion. So, um, and then this is one of the kleshas in Buddhism. um, And the kleshas, there's five of them, and they're the, um, the qualities, the tendencies that sort of prevent us from being liberated. And liberated means like we're not, you know, we're not owned by these old, these things that have happened in our past. We're not held hostage by this stuff anymore. Um, And liberated also means enlightened, you know, and look, you could, you can spend 30 years, I I have, working on this stuff and, you know, you're still, (laughs) you're still going to have, you're going to probably reach this place of like pure enlightenment, you know, I it's a daily practice, right? It's a life, it's a lifelong endeavor, but you can get to a place where you're not owned by these things. And that is what happened along the way as I realized I am so attached to um, creating like a happy family where everybody's living under one roof. This is an example um, that I'm not, I'm not willing to recognize the reality of what's happening here. Like I'm so attached to, you know, not letting go of that vision that I'm just not allowing space for another vision to emerge and trying to force this um, four people living under one roof thing and I'm going I'm going back to like when my kids were little and my first marriage 
you know, it's not, this is not good. It's not working. Like, it's not okay. And until I could sort of accept that and see that, I couldn't find a different pathway. And that different pathway is the thing that created, you know, I mean, it was a gift for everyone in the situation. It truly was. I have, you know, two beautiful, happy, wonderful teenagers who are secure. They know they're loved. They've, you know, they they grew up with security and safety and joy. And that would not have been the case if I had been unable to face reality, right? And deal with the reality that was in front of me. And sometimes that's what's happening. It's just like, we're so scared and we're so attached to things being a particular way that we're not creating any neural pathways to kind of imagine another another way forward that might create a lot more beauty and ease for everyone. And this doesn't mean that your heart doesn't break when these things happen, right? Like the last thing I wanted, my parents split when I was four and my first marriage ended when my son was four. It was like the absolute last thing I wanted, but in retrospect, it was absolutely the correct thing. And, you know, I suffered the most intensely when I wasn't willing to face that and look at it. And the minute that I realized, okay, wait a second, you know, it was very simple. It was very simple. Sometimes, like, we so don't want to see something that we're making the situation a lot more complicated than it actually is because we're just desperate for like any other explanation, any other solution other than the end of something, right? But the end of one thing is the beginning of something else always. And so I resisted that ending um, intensely and I suffered. I mean, I really, truly did. Um, you know, and sometimes the best thing you can do is just face, face the thing, right? Name it to tame it. Um, and that applies to all, everything, all aspects of life, right? Like if you're in a job and it's just, it's not the right job and it's not, for whatever reason, it's just not the right fit or you're in, um, you're in an environment that feels abusive or, you know, it's just, it's, it's killing your spark. (laughs) It's not sustainable. You know, that's, we're not going to be okay living in that state. I know that it's, we're in a different territory when you are um, trying to keep a roof over your head. I, or you and your family's heads. Like I totally, I'm not saying this lately, but if you're in an abusive environment, gotta find another like a way out you know another solution um because none of us can really you can't allow your soul to be crushed you know like you can't allow your spark to go out you're not going to be able to help anyone you're not going to be able to help yourself life's going to get really really dark and so when you find yourself in those situations or when you are spinning and trying to come up with well maybe if I do this or maybe if I try that or maybe I can make myself really small so I'm not upset I need to walk, I'm going to walk on eggshells it's such a it's such a moment to recognize what I'm the path I'm on is not it like this isn't going to I can't do you can't walk on eggshells forever you can't do that and you can't shrink yourself to make other people happy like that's not you're not that's not what you're here for um and I found myself in so many different situations like that as I grew where I really tried to it was like a chameleon you know I could I was very good at figuring out what does someone need and I you know beyond the abandonment stuff I had other things going on when you grow up in an alcoholic household there are a lot of Um, elements to that that are probably going to have an impact on you that sort of like tendency to uh, take the temperature of the environment all the time and to figure out like is this a safe environment today or not a safe environment and do I need to kind of make myself invisible or is there something I can do to like 
make the alcoholic happy or keep them, you know, at ease? Like, what can I, you're going to become very good at that kind of thing. So it wasn't just the abandonment. There were some other things that were happening that had an impact on me. And probably for you in your childhood, it's not one thing. It, you know, it might be like a few things that you're working with. We all have stuff. I mean, unless you're one of the very, very lucky people who had a beautiful childhood with, you know, secure, happy parents and a happy household where no tragedy kind of like befell you. And there just are not a lot of people who are going to raise their hands up when I say that and be like, oh yeah, that was me. Very few, you know, the, anytime you put a large group of people together, there's going to be stuff because we're human beings and human beings are, you know, everybody has their things that they're grappling with and the ways that they've suffered and the ways that that manifests. And so when you put a group of people together, you know, there are going to be dynamics, not just inside each individual, but then in the ways that these people are interacting with one another. And so there's usually stuff, right? To When you come out of your childhood and you look back, it's like, usually there are things that you're going to have to grapple with to some degree or another. And everything is a matter of degree, right? Like some people are grappling with really, really intense, painful abuse. And some people are dealing, grappling with like less intense stuff, but it's intense for them. It's all relative. So um, it's so important when you're trying to figure yourself out to try to go back and identify like if I have self-doubt or if I have, you know, doubt about my worth or my um whether I'm worthy of love like those were for me that was like some of my big stuff am I broken is there something wrong with me because I thought as a kid like my mother doesn't love me you know I really believed that and as I got older I realized my dad had really like you know unburdened himself on me and made me into like a little tiny therapist and wing person you know wing child and um so I had to like really look at all that stuff and the way that it impacted me and the way that I was then playing that stuff out in my friendships and my relationships. And it matters, you know, whatever your stuff is, it's like so helpful. It's such a relief to know what is driving you because it's like naming the beast, right? You've got to name it to tame it. That's Dan Siegel, psychologist, child psychologist, really brilliant. Um, it's kind of, it's like naming the monster under the bed and then it takes the power away from it. If you haven't, like that Jung quote, if you haven't brought this stuff to the surface to really look at it, then it's ruling your life. And you don't want to be ruled by fear or by a fear of goodbyes or by a fear of endings. And there are worse things than endings. But for a long time in my life, like my, definitely my 20s, my 30s, I was so, um, just the idea of things ending was so terrifying to me, especially when it came to people, to human beings, you know, that I worked overtime to try to avoid that. And sometimes that meant I stayed in friendships or relationships when absolutely it's like, this is not good. You know, this is not balanced. It isn't, you're not even like on your own radar here. Like, you know, because when you are so focused on not being left, or not having something end, well, then you're in fear and you're going to be accepting treatment that's, you know, probably far below what you would like. You're not going to be talking about your own needs or thinking about them. You're just totally focused on what do I need to do for this other person so that things will be good and I won't be abandoned. And that's just not a healthy foundation. I think we can all agree. And so whatever your things might be, they may not be the same things as my things, right? Just to figure out what they are so that they're not ruling your life and they're not ruling your decisions. So the four-year-old, five-year-old, 10-year-old you is not sitting at the head seat at the table, you know, making the decisions. Um, we're all going to have those days and events and things that happen where that little scared kid inside of us is the one that comes racing to the surface. And that's okay. You know, then the idea is like, what can I do to soothe myself here? What can I do to reassure this younger more scared version of me that like everything is all right um and those are really fun tools to work on you know being able to calm your nervous system but before you can get to that fun stuff it's like you've got to really unearth like what it is that's 
wreaking the havoc in your life, if there is havoc in your life, um, what it is that is creating those patterns that really aren't serving you. And so um, I was also talking about, you know, there are two ways we get left in this, in this world. And one of them is death, right? We lose people. And I have, you know, the last few years of my life have been that. Like I've, I, I'm not going to talk about this too much right now, but I watched my mother die in the most horrible, horrible way because of ALS. And, you know, watched my dad um, die over this past summer because of old age and heart failure finally in the end at 96. My mother was was really out of nowhere. She, you know, she there it was not the genetic um, kind of ALS. It was just this. It just came out of left field, and it destroyed her. It just it just ravaged her um, over the last year of her life and turned her. I mean, it just blew through her and took everything with it. You know, her ability to um, speak, swallow, talk, eat walk I mean it just took everything till she was just bones in a bed it was the most devastating I said I wasn't gonna talk about it so um it was devastating but I that is what's happened over the last few years of my life is I've lost both parents and um and I prior to that the only time I had ever been in a room with someone who had died was my grandfather my paternal grandfather when I was 10 And I was writing about that, you know, um, because it was a first and I, it's a, it's even if you're 10, it's not lost on you. There's a, there's a body in this room and the person is gone. You know, the person who lived in this body is not in it anymore. Um, and what does that mean? You know, and at 10, you're kind of like in that pure state of just, you don't have to have any other ideas put on the thing you can just kind of see this is it and I remember very clearly how just surreal it all felt and I wasn't really close to my grandpa I only met him a handful of times before I was there at the wake but it was the first time I had been at a wake and it was an open casket and um I went and you know I I asked my stepmom like if I could go and say goodbye and she said you know yes and kind of like brought me to the line and I just went along the line and then when it was my turn I went and I stood on the there was a little bench people were kneeling on but I was little and so I stood on the little bench and um, looked into the casket and saw him and he looked strange to me he was in a suit and tie and you know his hands were folded on his chest and he didn't look to be the right color and he had makeup on and powder and lipstick it was just like a very just was strange as a kid to sort of see that and you know have a lot of questions and confusion about it all like what it all meant and I told him I loved him and I leaned in to kiss him goodbye kissed him on the cheek and I had to lean so far in that my feet came up off the bench um, and somebody gasped behind me and I suddenly felt like, oof, you know, like, did I do something wrong? Is this not how you, do you not do this? Is this not how you say goodbye? And I went back, you know, to my stepmom and um, and she told me you know, people don't usually kiss kiss the body, but it's okay, you know. She was She was great about it, but I felt embarrassed and ashamed because a whole room full of people I didn't really know had seen me do that and the thing is and I was writing about this too there's there is no wrong way to say goodbye to someone um and also even then I knew he wasn't in that body anymore like I knew that as a kid I could see it and with my mom I was with her when it happened and I was there, you know, holding her hand and stroking her hair and talking to her. And I could feel her going. I could feel it. I could feel, um, I could just feel it happening. I could feel like whatever you want to call it, you know, whatever your beliefs are, I could feel sort of the energy in her body, her soul or whatever you want to call it. I could feel it leaving. And it hurts, <laughs> you know, it really hurts. It's a really painful um, 
just heartbreaking thing. And with her, we had such a complicated history for such a long time. Um, and we did, thankfully, thankfully, have closure in those last few weeks of her life and a lot of healing, which I'm so grateful for. But um, just the loss of her was so overwhelming. And I was writing about how I had the first panic attack of my life the day after, 12 hours after she died. I, um, I w- it actually began as I was walking, I was heading back to Los Angeles. I had, I spent, I slept for a couple of hours. It was, you know, five o'clock in the morning when I got home, uh, maybe 5.30. And I slept for like, I don't know, two hours. And then I got up and you know, grief is a really, it's, it's, if you've been there, then, you know, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but my, my stepdad was beside himself and he couldn't handle like her stuff everywhere. He was just like, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. Like it's, she's everywhere. She's been in the apartment for 50 years. So, I mean, her stuff was in every closet, every drawer, every, everything. And so I, um, didn't want to leave him like in that state if he wasn't okay. And so I, took the day and packed up all of her things and um I couldn't get to everything in the apartment but I got their bedroom into a situation where her closet was empty and her drawers were empty in the bathroom like you know so that he could be in the bedroom and not feel overwhelmed and but it was intense I mean I went through her I mean everything it was like it was an intense you know experience I mean to say the least and so then I had to leave and go fly back to Los Angeles knowing I would return in a few months to like do another pass on just sort of organizing things and um and I'm I've now done three or four of those passes where I've gone through her things and organized things and shipped things to myself you know that I want to keep and um and donated things and you know given things away to friends of hers she did not have a will which I will just say as we're talking about this kind of thing have a will like really truly for the people that you leave behind like let them know what your wishes are it's so it's so overwhelming to be in that situation where you're guessing and hoping that you're getting it right um and you know I I've done a lot of that with my mom like scattered her ashes like you know, at her best friend's beautiful house in France. And I scattered some ashes at this incredible vineyard in Tuscany, but I'm just guessing like, you know, I have a, I have, I scattered some of her ashes in my garden and I have a little altar for her, you know, so I've done the best that I can. And I think I've, I scattered some of her ashes at her mother's grave, which I know she would have loved, but these are all things I've just, I've had to guess. So, and same thing with her, like, you know, special trinkets and treasures. Like I've just, you know, had to kind of guess, like, I think she would really want this person to have this. And so, you know, we tend to avoid conversation about death in our culture, but it's going to (laughs) happen. To all of us we don't live forever and ever and it's a loving act to make it clear what your wishes are for the people that you're leaving behind so that on top of all the grief they're going through they don't have to try to figure out what you probably wanted you know and hope that they're right um, it's a tremendous it's a tremendous kind of burden to leave with someone and you know it's because the responsibility feels so huge to get it right and you have no way of ever knowing if you did or not. So um, that's my little aside about that. Just do the hard thing if it's hard for you. Make the will. Say what you want, you know, and then you don't have to think about it again. But to pretend that it's never going to happen is not the way to go. Um, and it really did inspire me because because my mother didn't do that. Like I, one of the first things I did after she died is that. You know, I, like, made sure that everything was really spelled out as far as, like, what I wanted so my kids would not be in that situation. Um, So the two ways we get left, death, right? And sometimes it's people go 
way sooner than my mom or my dad. My mom was 74. My dad was 96. You know, sometimes people are taken just boom. They're just, it's like a shock, you know, and, and way too soon, way too young. You know, it's, it's one of the really difficult parts of being a human being is that we don't know how long we have and we don't know how long anyone else has. And we don't like to think about it, you know, but every day there are stories in the paper of things that happened. It just happened here yet again in this country where I live, you know, and all the shootings that go on all the time. It's just, it's unbelievable. We lose people every day in the most senseless, just awful way. And so that's, that's, you know, aside from gun violence, it can happen anywhere, you know, tree can fall. I mean, anything can happen. And so, um, I know we don't like to think about it because it makes us so vulnerable, but I really, really think one of the best things I've learned is to think about it or to allow it to be alive in your mind just enough every day to inspire you not to waste time and to say the things that you need to say and to make sure the people that you love know how much you love them. Like, I think you want to be aware of the fragility of this whole thing enough that you're doing those things, you know, that if you're in the relationship that doesn't feel right or you're in the job that doesn't feel right, like you don't wait. You really try to figure out, okay, what's the next right step? And let me say the hard thing if I need to, you know. Um, in my At the end of my first marriage, like the last day of my first marriage I looked at my ex-husband and said you don't want to be here and it was like the absolute truth of the situation you know it was just let's just say the real thing like let's just say the simple thing you know as painful as it is as heartbreaking as it is that's the truth and it was like I mean I could breathe again for the first time in you know I don't know years and I mean, he probably could too, you know. Um, and of course, it it like it breaks your heart if that's the reality that you're facing in any relationship with anyone, friendship, you know, long term friendship, um, anything. I mean, it's it's really painful when you have to face the reality that like this is just we're at a fork in the road, and you want to go a different way. You know, you want to go down a different path here. You don't want to walk this path with me anymore. Of course it hurts. And that was the second way, right? The first way that we get left is death. And the second way we get left is choice. Someone decides like it's not working or we decide it's not working. You know, that's how endings happen, right? Like either someone is taken from us or we're taken from people or they decide or we decide this walking this path together you know any further is not it's it just doesn't feel right and that's brutal and you know um I'm not here to compare and contrast this is not a contest of what is worse <laughs> it's just these are two things we're all going to experience we're going to experience the loss of human beings we don't know how to live without because of death and because of choice and the choice part, I, the one thing I will say is that, you know, when someone leaves because they've died, um, depending on how they've died, right? Like it can, it can, we generally know like this is not a choice, even suicide, you know, people are in a world of pain, a world of pain. It's not a choice to leave you. It's a choice to end the pain, um, you know, so Um, I know these topics are really tough to just like think about and talk about, but I do think that it is, you know, there's going to be some part of your being that is relieved to just have the thing said. And the choice part, when someone ends a relationship, they're not gone, but they've ended the relationship. That is personal, right? Like that, and it feels personal. Um, It may have everything to do with them and nothing to do with you, but it's still going to feel personal. And it is personal in the sense that you will now have work to do to heal. It might not be about you or anything lacking in you, but the personal part is you're going to have this heartache to grapple with and heal. 
in order to move forward. So when someone leaves by choice or you leave by choice, and by the way, when you end something with someone, you still like, I don't, you know, I've, I've been in that situation. It still hurts like hell, you know, like hurting people is the last thing most of us want to do. Um, so both sides of those equ equation, like of that equation, when it is by choice or difficult, whether you're the one being left or you're the one leaving, it's brutal. And yet it's part of life. And so for me, what ended up happening after a tremendous amount of like thinking about all these things and working on it is I just realized, I think really two big things. One is this is part of life. You know, people die and people leave and sometimes I'll be the person leaving. Um, and the more you open to it, the less you suffer. So those two things, it's a part of life and the more you accept that it's a part of life, the less you suffer. And the more you can look at what are my attachments to things being a particular way, or like someone else wanting something that I want them to want, or saying what I want them to say, or needing what I want them to need. Like how much of that am I doing in my life and how much energy am I spending trying to get someone else to feel a way, you know, that I want them to feel or to want this thing that I wish they would want. Like what am I doing? You know, it's not, you don't need to do a sales job to get people to want to be in a relationship with you. Like they either want to be in a relationship with you and they want to be with you or they don't. And if they don't, the best thing you can do is like literally walk them to the door and open it. <laughs> like really like, okay, just please, you know, in peace, like I wish you well and here's the door because you're not here to convince anyone to love you or to want to be with you. You're not here to convince anyone that you are, you know, that you're special or you have beautiful things to offer. That's not it. It's like, those things are obvious, you know? I, each one of us is unique. You are the only you that has ever existed in all of time. I mean, I just really want you to try to wrap your head around that for a second, you know? Um, just even right now at this moment with 8 billion people on the earth, there's only one you. Forget about since the beginning of time. You are the only you we're ever going to get. And so if that's the case, right, you have your own unique perspective. You have your quirks. You have your fears. You have your, you know, all the things that are about you, your gifts, the way that you say things, the way that you think about things, the way that you see things and perceive them. Like those are so special and unique and no one else can replicate that. It's just you. And so your worth isn't even at issue. It's like you're here and it, there's only one. <laughs> so you're already like priceless. You know, you're, you're invaluable. Like there's no way to even put a like, you know, there's no way to put a number on it. You're just, you're invaluable. And, um, whatever gifts it is, whatever is inside you that you have to offer, like only you can do that. And you only have about a hundred years if you're very lucky to do it. So you really can't spend too much of that short amount of time with people who are making you doubt yourself, crush your faith in yourself, make you feel like you're broken or not enough or like, that's not it. You got to go. Like that's, <laughs> that is not what you're here for. Um, and you don't get enough time to do all the things that you're here to do. So certainly you can't spend a lot of it letting your soul be crushed, you know? That's just not, that's not love. And if that's what you're experiencing, if you're in a relationship or in a work environment or in any kind of friendship where you are feeling like I'm always chasing or trying to prove myself or trying to convince this person that I'm great, get out, get out, get out as fast as you can, get out. That's not it. That's not it. Um, you know, and I just, I mean, hearing someone tell you that, you know, it, it might help at the right moment. It's still you have to ultimately get there yourself. So, I mean, I hope that it helps. I wouldn't bother saying it if I didn't think it could help. But, you know, ultimately, like, you have to get a hold of that, of that feeling of like, yeah, wait a second. There is only one me. And, I, you know, I probably shouldn't let someone stamp my light out, you know, and it's not on them at a certain point. Like if you're staying and you're participating in something and I'm not 
again, I want to be really careful because sometimes you're in an abusive relationship with someone and you don't have the strength to leave. That's not on you. You know, there's probably a history of abuse there and this would be a good moment to like ask for help. Um, You know, figure, you know, find someone that you know you can really trust and ask for help. So I'm not in any way suggesting this is easy or always even safe sometimes you have to be really careful when I'm saying like get out like you have to be you have to be really have your wits about you um however you know what I am saying is those situations are not there it's not sustainable and it's not you know it's not where um it's just not where you not where you need to be you got to figure out the next right step to start moving out of that and that ultimately a goodbye you know as painful as it is is better than living that other way with just your your light being dimmed and you know trying to um shrink yourself so that is worse that is worse than saying goodbye and I learned that the you know the very hard way and the long way but I did really finally learn it and it was like such a relief to you it was such a relief it's just that live wire that had been there inside of me like all that fear of being left or you know I just was like oh no I don't even have to do that anymore (laughs) I don't have to give that any energy anymore I don't have to do that anymore I don't have to be owned by that I don't have to chase love I don't have to chase approval I don't have to like worry about my worth like I I can be done with that whole thing which was taking up so much time and energy and I can take that time and energy and, you know, put it toward like productive things and people who, um, I was writing about this like last week, like people who can, who see you for who you are and love you, you know, and that really is the best stuff in life. And this is how I want to end. It's just that, um, and by the way, the essay that I wrote, I like, I was really struggling with it this week and um, some of the writers will probably, you know, relate but I was just really grappling and struggling I just couldn't get it I was like laughing because I'm like yeah because I'm writing about endings and like endings are still you know it's such a um as much work as I've done on it and I've done a tremendous amount it's still really painful it probably wasn't the right week because um I just had a birthday and like I am still getting used to it's only my third birthday where my mom hasn't called you know um and I think it wasn't the right it was a it was a difficult environment to be writing but anyway that's neither really here nor there except it was sort of amusing that um I went today now that the birthday's over and like the kind of the storm cloud has cleared I went and edited the whole thing <laughs> so it's just funny like um endings are you know they're just they're just a part of life that we're all going to have to grapple with some way or another, but it's very liberating when you can get to that place where you're like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to miss out on loving people. That is the best stuff that we get. I have people in my life. They're the best. It's the best thing I know. You know, the people in my life, it is, it is the absolute best thing in life is connection and really knowing someone and being known, being seen, being understood, being able to do that for other people, you know, being able to listen, um, knowing when someone is actively listening to you and cares and is like in it with you. There's nothing better than that, you know? And so there is a risk involved in loving people. Of course, absolutely. On both sides, there's risk. We're again, vulnerable, but the rewards are so much better than goodbyes are hard right (laughs) goodbyes are hard but the reward of loving people far outweighs you know or maybe it isn't that it far outweighs let's just say it this way like you know for me in my experience and I'm not putting this on anyone um but you know the depth of grief that I felt after my mother died was at the same level of the amount of love I felt for her. Now, everybody's grieving process is different. So it's not like I'm not trying to quantify it, you know, um, people grieve in different ways, but that was my experience. And so even if the, the reward of loving people is equal to the grief you're gonna experience when they go, still, if you're gonna be here on planet Earth, I mean, you gotta love your heart out. 
That's really what I think. And that's what I want to leave you with, that thought. And I hope that this conversation is helpful and you know, just gives you food for thought to think about the things in your own childhood and your own life and the patterns that you might be repeating and any doubts that you have and just not to waste time and to, um, yeah, again, to really love your heart out. So thank you for joining me for this talk. And I'm sending you tons of love right now. Thank you.